sorry to say, but we spoke Swedish to each other in the corridors and, and became friends nevertheless. A recent statement from one of his former students who was lucky enough to actually take a class sums up what I know about him intuitively. Dr. Selen was intense, interesting, and caring. His knowledge of the subject matter was as deep as his evaluation of it honest. His teaching style, method is too clinical a term, influenced how I taught in the Los Angeles Unified School District for nearly 24 years. Paul has worked extensively on neo-Latin criticism, Anglo-Dutch relations, English literature from Shakespeare through Milton, and Anglican and Reformed theology from the reign of Queen Elizabeth to the Restoration. His current research centers on John Milton, some Renaissance Dutch figures whose names I hes hesitate to pronounce, as well as the importance of Sir Walter Raleigh's Dutch translation of his discovery of Guana. All that work, in turn, has resulted in over 35 articles and four books. The articles he has published in such prestigious journals as Renaissance Quarterly, Studies in Philology, Huntington Library Quarterly, Modern Language Review, Journal of English and Germanic Philology, Modern Philology, and Viator. And the most recent of his books from 2011 is particularly germane to tonight's talk. Treasure, Treason, and the Tower, El Dorado and the Murder of Sir Walter Raleigh. And in this book, through his chance discovery of a neglected Dutch correspondence in a Swedish archive, he blows apart the standard narrative of Sir Walter Raleigh. Following an exciting paper trail through Jacobean history to modern day Venezuela, Paul makes a convincing case for Raleigh's innocence of the charges that led to his decapitation in 1618. I wish ACMRS had published that book. Instead, though, I give you the sleuth himself speaking on Raleigh's lost new world. say, after a very nice introduction like that, you're all going to have to suffer for the rest of the evening. <laughs> okay? And uh, one thing that, that this is about, well, there are two things. That, uh, one is whoever thought up the compass idea is directly relevant to what we're talking about tonight. And the, yeah, the other thing is, I have bought the book along because it's got a number of errors in it that I made because I hadn't read the Dutch, okay? So I put it out here. It's got some pretty pictures in the middle if you want to take a look at the uh, at what the Venezuela actually looks like a little bit, okay? okay. So I put it on the floor here for you and you can reach it. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Well, this is, we're going to start with what the notion of Raleigh's last word is on the question of, of, of Guiana, that is in the northern coast, the North Caribbean coast of Venezuela. So here we go. Brace yourselves. Okay. Prompted, prompted by the attack of a huge Spanish armada in the summer of 1588, that by the grace of unforeseen imponderables, failed to crush Protestant England and finish off the rebel Dutch. Sir Walter Raleigh sought control of the Caribbean in order to deprive Spain of the American bullion that financed its European wars. Am I coming across clearly? Can you hear me? Okay. Aware of Spanish plans for a new expedition out of Trinidad to add to the fabled treasures of the of El Dorado to the resources, Raleigh pushed to get there first by boldly invading the island on March 22nd, 1595, and then taking a 200-mile trip 
through the Delta Amakuro, that's a delta the size of, of Belgium as a matter of fact, and up the Rio Orinoco, west of the Rio Caroni, a great but then scarcely known tributary presumed to lead some 150 miles or more southwards to the fabled El Dorado, its mouth being that way, its mouth turned out to be absolutely impassable. End of the, you know, end of the expedition. Oh, the Orinoco venture was not fruitless, however, and exploring both banks of the Rio Grande, he had developed alliances with native chieftains, one of whom showed him a hard rock load of gold-bearing quartz. The upshot was a publication in 1596 of the first great travel book in modern English. It's entitled, The Discovery of the Large, Rich, and Beautiful Empire of Guiana. Try to remember that. With the relation of the great and golden city of Manoa, which the Spanish called El Dorado, and other provinces of Emaria, Aromaya, Amapaya, and other countries, with the rivers adjoining. Raleigh immediately commissioned a second voyage to Guiana, this time under the sole command of Captain Lawrence Kemis, because Sir Walter had to help lead the daring Anglo-Dutch attack on Cadiz, Spain, in 1596. It not only occupied the main naval base, protecting Spanish shipping across the Atlantic, but they destroyed forces about to sail for for Guiana to forestall another Raleigh incursion there. Chemis returned to Port Portland Road in July of that year and immediately published his relation of the second voyage to Guiana. Remember that title too, please. Including a remarkable outline of some 52 rivers plus harbors, settlements, and inhabitants along the Costa Sobae. Of the, as the Guiana coast was then called. As both these books were, were in English, a language not yet respected in international diplomacy or widely read in the 16th century Europe, translations to other tongues came quickly. The very first was a Dutch one that Cornelis Clausen published at Amsterdam in 1598. The following year, the De Brais of Frankfurt brought out their famous Latin folio edition, as well as a German translation, not to speak of the famous Hulsius's Nuremberg, Nuremberg abridgments. It was, of course, through Latin that Raleigh first won international readership at the highest intellectual, professional, and political levels, not the least because of the striking illustrations that the book De Bray of, of volume offers. As a result, Virtually all scholars turned to the Debray images to interpret Raleigh as though that text derived directly from the original English. Ironic, because way back in 1867, Dr. Peter Thiele, curator of the Leiden University Library, went out of his way in French, no excuse, to, uh, with Dutch, to make clear that the Debray Latin does not derive directly from Raleigh's English but follows a Dutch version of 1598. Hence, Raleigh's last word in quotation marks from me about his discovery of Guiana resides not in the original English discovery of 1596, which is which everybody reads, but in the Clausen's Amsterdam revision of 1598. Now, is this really important? Should we care? Do we need to care about the Clausen's Dutch? Dutch to study Raleigh? Well, of course, I wouldn't be here otherwise. Okay. <laughs> of some half dozen in instances of why I think that, let me offer three. We have a time problem here. One, we think of the Rio Orinoco as rising in southeastern Venezuela near the Brazilian border, then looping northwards around the Guiana Shield, the, the, the uh, the geological formation that forms the center of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Venezuela to form the western border with Colombia, at which point it turns sharply eastward and empties into the Atlantic after a journey of 1330 miles. However, the Raleigh Clausen named title page explicitly describes the river as, much, as a much shorter stream, 
originating on the eastern slopes of the Andes, not among the towering sandstone tepuis in the eastern Venezuela. According to Raleigh, the Orinoco has its headwaters, not in Venezuela, but some, and I quote, some 500 German miles away in Colombia, directly to the east of Quito, Quito Ecuador, the northernmost city of the ancient Incan Empire. When reading Raleigh, as we shall see, scholars need to be aware of this. That was my first mistake, okay? Now, second one. When one of Raleigh's men, a very proper young fellow, left out of the boat to enjoy a swim in the Orinoco, he was, in all our sights, taken and devoured by a man-eating creature that Raleigh's English termed an ugly serpent, a lagarto, equals lizard or, or, or crocodile in the same breath. What was meant, a 30-foot anaconda or a half-done or an open cro crocodile? My recent book opened to, oh, opted for crocodiles as splashes triggered their attack. The marginal rubric governing the text in the Dutch translation reveals how the English led me to go wrong by simply stating how a black lad was devoured by a snake. And let's take a look at what we have here. Ah, I have to go this way. One more. There you have it. That's a 1625 correction. Of, uh, of, uh, now, this is maybe a little bit out of proportion, but not entirely if you think of a 30 footer. 20 footers are still not uncommon, and they will stop human beings. Uh, we can have to say things, um, and that's what we're talking, that's what he's talking about there. So, now, we can talk about this thing if we have a discussion period afterwards because this isn't the main show here, okay? Needless to say, the Debray Latin text of 1599 to 1625, that's from the 1625 one that that illustration comes, follow not Anglo Raleigh's Anglo reading of the Spanish, but the proper restatement in the Dutch version. Thirdly, anyone attempting Trace Raleigh's wake of the Orinoco, which is what I tried, in order to find the one fatal gold mine he did locate, has to be able to pinpoint just where he was at any given date. In lieu of an identifiable spot, the English tells us only that the company chanced to enter a river that we call the River of the Red Cross because it had no name. The old style date Raleigh's English gives for this is the 22nd of May, almost a month later than the Spanish records show. According to them, Raleigh's hunt for the Eldorado began not in late May, but somewhere around Friday, April 18th, old style. In describing how Raleigh's galley went aground, and I quote, on the third day we entered the river, the English says, we got her afloat the next morning. However, the Dutch reads, Sunday morning, Sunday morning. Hence, comparison with the, with the Spanish quickly reveals which of the four weekends in April was involved. In 1595, that Sunday would have been April 20th, Easter Sunday, no less. Raleigh well, doesn't say anything about that in his book, of course. Actually, uh, he celebrated Easter at that point. Okay, um, as the vessel could be not be gotten off until the next morning, the fourth day upstream, counting back indicates that Sir Walter's vessel entered the Orinoco Della not in mid-May, but about April 17th. Though but a tiny detail in Clausen's describing the word Sunday establishes a fairly sound time, timeline for tracking Sir Walter Raleigh that the English text goes, seems to go out of its way to hide. Now, how did such information get into Raleigh's Dutch text when it's not in the original English text of 1596? 
The answer resides in a cartouche in the upper right-hand corner of the extraordinary offshoot at the Amsterdam Valrachtige and Kronige Beschreibung von Giana, the title, the Dutch title of the book, generated in 1599, namely Jogokus Honius's new account, new map of the wondrous and gold-rich land, Giana. His source for the latitudes and true positions along the German coastline, Guiana coastline, was a, quote, certain ship's master who sailed and explored with Raleigh and Chemis in 1594, 1595, and 1596. Even more astonishing, the same cartouche also states in closing that the details of, and I quote, the inland provinces have been extracted with great trouble from the two little books that by and under the direction of Raleigh aforesaid has seen the light of day. Lest this statement be misinterpreted, the title page of the Venus Hulsis's 1599 Brevis Admiranda Descriptio Regni Gianni, as a previous abbreviated selection from Raleigh, makes it perfectly clear that Honius was alluding not to an English original entitled Discovery, but to a Descriptio describing in Dutch that is that made up of two books, the Duo, Duovus Nibelis, Comprehensa, squeezed together, squashed together, um, from which, and I quote, from which Eudocus on this ready an elegant geographical map with added commentary in Dutch. As Hondius had nothing whatever to do with the printing of the English originals in 1596, let alone provide them with maps, the exact meaning is obvious. Given then that Raleigh both published and directed Collison's translation of his discovery and Chemus's second voice to Guiana, both of them were in, 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 the, in, the, in the Dutch text, does this fact imply any special scholarly value on the Dutch version that the students of Sir Walter Raleigh's famous text should take seriously? When he returned to England in early September 1595, he began preparing his discovery for publication in order to convince his aging queen that to protect herself and her realm, England should wrest Guiana from Spanish hands while there was still time. However, and I quote a recent authority on this, the production of his printed work turned out to be a bruising experience. Sir, Walter, Sir Walter's original authorial voice was edited, altered, restrained, if not at times virtually censored by his, by his delicate D. So Robert Cecil, Cecil and other associates had financial interest in the Guiana venture. Shortly after it became clear in mid-December that Her Majesty was not going to go after Guiana as he thought English should, Raleigh told his cousin, Lady Barbara Sidney, wife of Colonel Sir Robert Sidney, the brother of the great Sir Philip, by the way, governor of the English cautionary town of Flissingen, that he was thinking of approaching the States General to, and I quote him, join with him in his intended voyage. When the printed discovery saw light in 1596, the final paragraph clearly reveals his decision to look to foreign powers. I trust in God that he, king of all kings, will put it into her heart, which is lady of ladies, to possess Diana. If not, I will judge those men worthy to be the kings thereof, that by her grace and me will undertake it of themselves. Those worthy to be kings thereof did turn out to be the Dutch states general. Indeed, the first to profit from Raleigh's Valrachtel the saving was Nicholas de Haan, a ship owner from the community of Flemish merchants in Rotterdam, blessed moreover with nothing less than our description of Hamad by Sir Walter Raleigh of the, golden, of the one golden motive found along the Orinoco, Orinoco. This expedition, the first of the United Provinces, licensed exclusively to trade in Guiana, departed Holland 
on December 3rd, 1597, and arrives some, some 13 months later, on, on December 28th, 1598. As the legal affidavit shows that the commis general supervising the voyage drew up for the States General on 3 February 1599, the Hans vessels recapitulated Demas's sailing in direct accord with Raleigh's orders. Notably enough, they spent most of their time on acquiring such hugely prized trade items as Brazil wood along the coast of Guiana, instead of going primarily after Raleigh's gold in, in, on the Orinoco. Okay, so much then for the Dutch text as Sir Walter's last word on his English discovery. Let's now take our first our first look at Chemus's relation to the second voyage to the to to Guiana of 1596 as well. For Raleigh's Dutch volume includes both. In deciding to translate the two narratives, the simplest option was to print them back to back in one binding. However, the English originals were utterly conventional, unimaginative quarters. For his Dutch press, however, Raleigh chose nonetheless than the, than the then greatest of Amsterdam publishers, Cornelis Clausen. Clausen was, in fact, the founder and, as has been put as, the driving force behind the sudden growth of Holland excellence in cartography, description of foreign lands, and navigation, including not only vernacular accounts of Dutch voyages and discovery in all parts of the world, <clears throat> but also remarkable translations into Dutch of foreign travel histories like Raleigh's and Chemus's. While Clausen retained the quarto format, he and Raleigh did not print a portrait quarto, but in an innovative online one. Do you understand the difference between that? This would be portrait, this, this would be landscape. So in other words, what they do on this thing is they turn it that way, okay? All right, suggestive of a, of a coffee table book, an oblong quarto turns the sleeves 90 degrees sideways, thus converting them into landscape layouts rather than portraits. Here's the main title page governing the whole. There we are. We're looking at a book that should be in normal thinking this way, but it's actually this way. Now, I, I keep talking to you, I'm going to lose my place. All right, it's your fault. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As you can see, as you can see, such a title can spread out, out laterally across a whole, whole landscape page. It almost looks like a folio. A for, a, a folio, imagine, okay? And and it can occupy a good third or more of, of, of than the usual foot, so much so that the printer could could expand basic titles to include voluminous lists of contents to ensnare readers casting but a glance at the title page. You're sitting next to it, it's on the coffee table next to you, say it. Obviously, Clausen's title takes full advantage of the oblong layout. Anything but short, it profiles all the achievements recorded in the entire volume. Rather than take time to fuss with the Dutch, let me double time do it in my English. Do you want me to do that? I can give you a couple of things. You can follow the Dutch graphs at the top for a little bit. Voracious and Voracious and thorough description of the great and golden kingdom of Gaia. See it situated in America, to the north of the Great River or Rigiana, from the fifth degree south to the fifth degree north equator, in which description the correct location of the great and rich capital city Manoa, Makurai, and other cities of the same kingdom, and of that great salt lake Panama, being about 200 Spanish miles long, is laid out. Similarly, what kind of rich words are found in the so-called spleen stones? Um, pearls, balsam oil, red pepper, gin, sugar, incense, various medicinal 
rootlets, live herbs, and guns. Likewise, silk, cotton, and Brazil wood. Probably the best price of all. Together with the description, when we go on then, with the, of the surrounding territories, rich territories, Emeria, and so forth, in the last of which the warrior women named Amazons dwell, with the description of 50, 53 big rivers, along, among which the Orinoco is the main one, which starts about 500 German miles inland, not far from Quito, a famed capital city in Peru, all explored with great diligence and described in the years 1595 and 1596 by the noble lord Walter Raleigh, Walter, Walter Raleigh, knight and captain of the Guard of Her Majesty of England, and the renowned seafarer, Captain Lawrence Kemis. Well, I think right here is right here is the phrase I'm just about to talk about. Captain Lawrence Kemis. Okay. Am I turning my face too far aside this time for you? Time you guys. Okay. Well, I think most Raleigh Anners today regard Chemis as but Sir Walter's lowly subaltern. Note that this is not the, this too is not the relationship that the Clausen arrangements counts. On the contrary, Ron, Raleigh's final line goes out of its way to the Capitaine Lawrence Kemis, jumping out in all our minds as then, the from Martin C. Carter, famous in his famous in his own right. Not only did the oblong oblong uh, layout enable images and landscape to spread across this tossed the entire width of leaf, but it also left much vertical space, which which Clausen and Raleigh immediately took advantage. This, this is what I'm talking about. Neither of the English originals included a map of the of the North Atlantic that would enable Anglo-American Anglo-European readers to orient themselves vis-a-vis -vis the American, Caribbean, and tropical Guiana from the north of the Amazon to the Orinoco and Trinidad. As you can see, here, here, here would be the, the north of the Orinoco, and uh, where is Trinidad? It's over in here somewhere. It's, it's, it's not, the, and you, you can see how that goes. Okay, this being C, and it's in the lower half of England is the only thing that counts, right? And I'll see this now. Here is the equator. I'm going to repeat this in a minute. <coughs> That's how this is done. Here is his prime meridian, the place where you start with zero. And it is not the same as ours. Uh, ours at the present time going through uh, through late through England. <clears throat> okay, so neither of the English originals included a map of the North Atlantic that would enable Anglo-European readers to orient themselves vis-a-vis -vis the American Caribbean and tropical Guiana, from the mouth of the Amazon to the Orinoco and Trinidad. However, that is exactly what, what the very first illustration ever did Grace Raleigh's work on Guiana goes out of its way to provide. This chart was not original, however. It had a remarkable genesis in an earlier copper engraving of the Western Hemisphere that the brilliant and well-educated Flemish engraver Eudocus Honlius did in the course of tinkering with Mercator's rejection between 1569-1597. Given there is no time to go into this material properly here, suffice, suffice it to say that after presenting the Western Hemisphere of the globe, Honlius set his equator at the 90th degree, halfway between the poles in other words, Marking each degree at that point as a small square. You see right there? That's, that, that's, the, that's the most accurate they have, but it does result in accuracy. But of course, it lengthens the, it lengthens the, if they lengthen out as you go northwards, and the distortion occurs that follows when you have Mercator, when you have Mercator reckoning. 
Okay. As its primary meridian, it chose not our Greenwich latitude, that's east-west, but set it at what for us is about 30 degrees west because this longitude runs equidistant between the coast of Brazil and Africa, the coast of Brazil and Africa, and open, relatively safe water all the way from Iceland to the Antarctic ice field. I find that being gone. What did I do? I hope you enjoy the recapitulation. <laughs> okay. Um, where was I now? Oh, yeah. Yes. You notice the ice shelf is down here. They don't know much about it, so there's an artificial fish there. But down right here to the equator, you have a straight line, and you go right through the islands, Cabo Verde, and that sort of thing, with plenty of distance between the plants. Because the last thing on Salem was is to have a landfall when there's a nasty, nasty storm, right? To provide that, that small map that Clausen and Raleigh needed for their title page then, all the Yodokas had to do was simply to copy the North Atlantic segment of this hemisphere on which he had work, worked out the North Atlantic longitudes between 280 degrees west and 40 degrees east, and latitudes between 2 degrees south and 55 degrees north. As you can see, not only did his Mare del Monde thus situate the Caribbean vis-a-vis -vis Europe and enable rough calculations of the distance, but showed a ready and easy way to get from England to Eastern Guiana via the longitude 30 west and the westerly trade winds that blow north, just north of the equator. In 1594, Raleigh clearly knew nothing of Hongius's map before setting off for Trinidad. Otherwise, he would not have started there. However, Sir Walter secured a copy as soon as he returned to Plymouth in 1595 and used it immediately in arranging the second voyage under Chemus. Undoubtedly following Hondius's prime meridian, good captain in Florence did fall directly, and I quote him, so far to the southwards by Raleigh's specific directions, he says, that he reached one degree 40 minutes north. Uh, we'd be, yeah, we're looking at something like about, about this, and then they pick up the trade winds and it'll, it'll carry them right over to, 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 uh, to Ghana, is what, you're, what we're looking at. There he picked up the easterly trade winds the Fed wafted his vessels to an easy landfall at the Spanish North Cape and found safe anchorage in the Fair and Great River underwater. And now we're talking about this area right here, these capes in this. You see, the trade winds will just pick you up on the back of the gun and just blow you straight across. It's up by the currents in the ocean, by the way. Okay. Hondius concluded his pioneering chart by bookending it with two imaginary niches featuring monumental statuary. On the left, a male nude cannibal shouldering a human ham, ham hot with leg attached. <laughs> on the right, you know those folks are trying to sell something to you. On the, on the, on the right, uh, a fully a tattooed, fully armed Amazon. Notice, and it's a little bit hard to see on this rather worn, it must have been printed, must be a late copy, so, so the plates are rather worn. It's hard to see it uh, that well, but her, uh, her breast is unmutilated. You know that that classical tradition, don't you? Okay, just as Raleigh observed about warrior women in the Americas, for what it's worth, so did Rubens in his Battle of the Amazon, starting just a couple of years later. So much then for the main title page and introductory opening the volume. Next comes, hang on, Sir Walter, Sir Walter's own discovery title in Dutch, but now under a <coughs> subtitle that names it as a description of the golden and lovely kingdom of Guiana. 
presently occupied by the ancient inhabitants who rule and ruled by the descendants of Gyanakapa, formerly a powerful king in Peru. The translation, as opposed to the original English, which does not do this, the translation thus shifts the focus of the more generalized English discovery from the large, rich, and beautiful empire of Ghana to explicit action and imagined riches of the Incan survivors of the Spanish conquest and supposedly now inhabited it. By the way, I'm not saying that I believe that. That's, I'm just saying that's what he said. Significantly enough, this raw subtitle entails no illustration at all. It's surprising. Therefore, thereby reinforcing the credit the main title page generously gives Keenus as a famous sea hero in his own right. There is also a technical improvement over the English originals. All but one of the first 20 leaves of the Dutch text adds from four to 10 helpful marginal re ru rubrics right to one person. They serve rather like modern subject indices, albeit presented in narrative order rather than alphabetical. Finally, Finally, Chemus's relation of the second voyage to Guiana, performed and written in the year 1596, closes out the Dawson volume. As originally printed by Dawson in 1596, the skimpy title of the English relation is exaggeratedly modest, given what Captain Lawrence actually accomplished. In coasting the seaside of Guiana from south to north, exactly as ordered, this word and per and poetic explorer charted the mounts of and named some 52 rivers flowing into the Atlantic, including some 40 several great ones that he thought he was the first to discover. He identified many peoples and had their banks. He identified many people in inhabiting their banks and named the chieftains when he could. More important, he came up with not unlikely bearings for fatal cities of El Dorado and the huge salt lake supposedly lurking in Guiana's northern interior. In the course of these inquiries, his observations focused on Raleigh's still active hope of finding large rivers flowing out of the interior, like the Oriapoc and, and Cayenne, French Guiana, the, um, the Corentin and Suriname, and above all, the Essequibo, the border of British Guiana. Coastal Indians thought more feasible ways to reach El Dorado than trying to get around the unbroken ledge of 21 roaring cataract, 60 fun, five and a half feet high, that stopped Sir Walter in 1595. As if this weren't enough, Chemus also succeeded in finding a free and open entrance directly into the Orinoco proper, proper without having first to traverse the delta. In short, he rendered virtually all the risks and travel that Raleigh suffered while struggling through the Delta Orinoco to get from Trinidad to El Dorado via the Rio Grande as essentially irrelevant. He's very nice about it. He would never call it a failure, but I don't know what else you would call it. What then does the translated title page of Chemus' second voyage look like? Again, fully exploring advantages of the oblique format Sir Walter and Clausen's admiration fills two fifths of it. Here's the Dutch title, as you can see, with Raleigh again touting Chemus. And I don't think I need to read this. All oh, it takes time, and you, wonder, you, you can see it. And once again, and once again, you notice once again the praise given to Chemus. Everything we explained with greater assiduousness and described in the year 1596 by the stout-hearted and famous seafarer, Captain Laurentium Chemis. Like the main page of the book, Faratachem Kronik of Sreviger, the Chemis subtitle also carries a remarkable engraving that occupies some three-fifths of the oblong page. Now I'm talking about all this stuff here at the bottom, right? Okay. What do we do with that? Um, this is fiction. This is this depiction 
ignores cartographical accuracy, but provides three aspects of Guyana that represent the very first effort in print to tantalize readers with exotic images from what Raleigh's tropical Guyana had to offer. As such, it set the tone for the flood of images that the Dutch discovery unchanged, unchained from the time of the great prince of the Debes Latin translation of 1599 right up to the present. First, the back background, left to center. It reflects no particular landscape in, in Guiana, as far as I can see. By ignoring mangroves, mangroves and, and the images portray no actual mountain ranges or known peaks, although the water shown is salty sea. By ignoring mangrove swamps, a thick jungle, which you would have in the area. On this, also a plenty of white space, white space, um, in which uh, to sketch out, to sketch not the usual geographers, fanciful creatures, but real, as, real ones as if out in the open, such as a five foot stag. Where would that do our stag? I can't see where this I would self. Uh, a light up stag, a rabbit uh, sized rodent called a guti, nor um, or no good crocodilians stalking, stalking devouring peccaries. For our native homes, native swinging home, a game, game fowl, and the, in the center, a springing leone. Otherwise known in Spanish as, of course, well, that's why we say Mount Lion, don't we? Okay, all right. The foreground dominates, however. From left to right, it offers three samples of natives from very different parts of Guiana. First, number one, here on the left. Well, it's there anyway, you can see it, right? Um, a riparian living near the, uh, this is a riparian living near the river of the Amazons. My translation of Latin. A native using a pelican to fish. He doesn't really know what a pelican is. The only thing he can really think of is the goose, but he knows how they did it. He's been told about it. Two, inhabitants of the, of the Isla San Marco. <laughs> I'm glad you can put up with this. <laughs> Thank you very much, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Or what was I? To the inhabitants of Santa Margarita. Santa Margarita. That's here. And what? A lot of interesting activity there. Famous because of the perf because of the great pearl fisheries of Isla and Cubagua and Coche. Two dugouts, two dugouts. One here, one there. Deliver, what, the closest one delivering a load of pearl oysters for consumption and treasure. At the, at the prow, a diver pulling up his fellow after a minute and a half of the water. They are shown as working with sat, not weighted baskets, as is sometimes assumed. Further out, a native, the native about to dive. Holding a large stone to take him to the bottom in order to maximize time underwater. These vessels supposed, supposedly operated with crews of four to seven natives, when I read Little Tribe encountered, and by Joe Hansis Dagas confirmed the claim. Three, now we go to the last one here, on the far right. A, a man from the land of Iwai Panoma. This is high upon. Honest's pioneering image of the fable, the charm Desdemona, men without heads who have their eyes on their shoulders and their mouths in the middle of their breasts. Honest's decision about placement of eyes and nose, not to speak of the sculpted body, its posture, and heavy bow plus arrow, have enjoyed constant reproduction in the days of Raleigh, Pulses, and Shakespeare up to our own. Not bad for the world's first look at Ghana. 
Was I off too far? Did you hear my last sentence there? Uh, finally, did you notice that when we're asked, Kim's account of 1596 lists the discovery of about 52 rivers? The main title page of both the Dutch translations specify 53. You didn't? Shame on you. As, as the report shows that Abraham Kabelja presented to the States General on February 3, 1599, the title page of Harat Kabeh seems to date not from the 1598 it specifies, but from the early January 1599, because the Dutch main title page the king as a subtitle, both acknowledge the extra river that the Hans expedition apparently reassessed during its own remarkably long voyage during the uh, 15 months. Now that we've finished our observations regarding the two volumes and, and Andreas's illustrations of Vienna, what's missing? Well, what is missing? What would you like to have? Gold. What? <laughs> Gold. Well, yeah, okay. What are you really, yeah, okay, you like gold. <laughs> <laughs> you, you what? But, the, but he never found any. He never opened the loan. How can you? Well, I have a different view of that. Let me tell you what the facts are, okay? Yes, surely a full post-discovery map of Guiana showing the basic results justifying the effort and investment of all. Well, as I mentioned before, Aeneas added just such an engraving as if a colophon that governs the far afternoon and Ronida Vesuvi as a whole, meaning the two, the two books in one binding plus an engraving. Here is his new card, his new in, in full hand culprit. Yeah, I hope it's there. There we are. That is a hand colored map from, from the period. Okay. Um, um, let's start with some first things first here. One thing that has to be straightened out right away. Ah, uh, Come on, stop. There we go. And so, do you see down here? Uh, right down here, the, uh, the, the engraver identifies himself as Jodokas Andreas. That, that's an issue because sometimes they have the wrong author for it. They will have the map, but without the sun. But it's very clear that it's Hondius's, uh, it's, it's Hondius's, uh, I won't go into why we, why we go into that now. It's, 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 a, it's a, an, an important question. Being quite large, that is, it's 12 and 3 eighths by 20 and 1 half inches, Clausen's quarter format is too small to accommodate this engraving. However, you can see at a glance that a systematic view is, it illustrates the essentials of what Raleigh Keynes and the, the Han voyages discovered. Okay, first the coasts. Very delicate, very delicate, delicately drawn, drawn at, at the latitudes and locations. Where we're now up in here. We're going to be talking about this section right here. You remember that Hondius' source for updated information on Guiana coastline was, quote, a certain ship's master in Dutch, Stierman, <coughs> who has, quote, sailed and explored Guiana in the aforesaid years. I've translated the Dutch. This was William Down, who had, in fact, served under the city served as such under Kings during his second voyage. Note, note first, this is so unhandy, note first, note first the equator, 
Okay. Here we have the equator here. Note too that on this map there are no means of determining longitude. We have no longitudes. You see what I mean? There's no, there's no grade for longitude. What you do have, though, is a scale of degrees on the left hand, so that the latitudes are easy to find. Raleigh has been Raleigh has been criticized for enormous for erroneous reckonings that put the lower Orinoco at 4 degrees 30 minutes, that's one thing, from the equator, whereas they would quickly criticize him by saying that he was willing. He was actually at 9 degrees. What kind of a navigator was he? Yet, according to the scales on Honeyus's maps, the latitudes Raleigh gives, the latitude Raleigh gives is relatively correct, inasmuch as Elizabethan charts differ sharply from modern ones regarding the size of our blue globe, globe, such specifications of latitude may indeed reflect geographical errors. I'm not in the business, I don't know. But the seaman using them is not the one who's at fault. So my, okay. At about one degrees, at about one degrees, um, 40 north again, do you see a small dotted line starting where are we? Gotta get the right key here. There's a small dotted line there beginning. Do you see it? Right out right along the shoreline. Right out in the water. Do you see it? Yes. Is it clear enough to be able to see it? It kind of looks like a shadow. Yes, it's a series of dots. Well that that is the that is the, the, that is the journey that they took, that Kings took and the Dutch took, following Raleigh's orders. And in this case, there's, that, that line stops here, doesn't it? It doesn't go past the delta. Instead, it stops there because the Dutch expedition, as well as Kings, went up the Orinoco in sort of a quick take, looking for Raleigh's mine, but Nothing, nothing serious about it. And when they exited, and I'm thinking of the Dutch in particular, they went out this way through the through the Orinoco Delta and back into the sea here. And here you see the journey commence, evidently ending here at what is called the Dragon's Mouth between the between the the, the uh, Venezuelan Main and Trinidad. Damn, I'm sorry. Excuse me for saying. <coughs> what am I doing now? It's over, it's okay. What's that? It's wonderful. You can just press the back button. I passed it. I passed the back button. I got it. Okay. That's the last one. Okay. How do we get off to this? <laughs> Which one did you want it on? I wanted one one or two back. There we are. That's that's what we need. I'm going to turn away. Can you still hear me? Yep. I'm wringing my neck here. Okay, you saw that thing. Okay. It continues up to the Orinoco where it stops. And then, and, and I showed you exactly where he ended his reconnoitering at the dragon's mouth. Regarding dreams of gold surplusage at El Dorado, though, Raleigh had not given up, albeit he now emphasized exploring access to the Ingen, that's my quotation of my thinking, the Ingen, well, I don't know, he calls it that, interior of Guiana, not via the impassable colony, but from the Atlantic coast. Thus, when Chemus charted his travels, he was constantly on the lookout for alternative waterways to places such as Macaguarai, the first city of Kuna. Uh Should be up in here, here somewhere. I can't quite see from here myself. So, Prince Saga. First, city, for this giant city of Manoa, which is going to be here. I think I've got that right. Okay. Thus, when Kings started his travel, 
was constantly on the lookout for those uh, all the waterways to such places. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, Pontius instructed this was a special pace for commenting on three of the some 50 rivers. And then we won the Via Pago. The Via Pago, whose inhabitants, we are told, sail in 20 days with their canoes from the mouths of the river down to the, down to the lake where the city of Manoa is situated, to the Cayenne or Cayani, a very beautiful and suitable river. People think for certain, now we're, now we're looking up in this area here, it's, it's, it's these statements that make this in Dutch, and I'm only taking the kernel of them out for your presentation. People think for certain that via this river one has access to the great lake and great city of Manoa, rich in gold. That's a commentary that Hondius has put on there. It's a quotation again from Rollins' materials. And three, the Essequibo. The best bet would be because the people surrounding it, quote, sailed from the mouth of the same in 20 days to within a day's journey to the great lake Parime. So much then for down savage coast, coast of Ghana. As for the interior and ter in territories, Andreas complained that he had to extract them with great trouble out of both the little books published by and under direction of the aforesaid Raleigh, which is a, which I read to you before. Indeed, Sir Walter scatters them somewhat under Scandler through his English original. Again, time is too limited to deal fully with this matter. So let's begin with the 10 animals that Andreas depicts. Fantasy or reality? From the from the right, from the left, the top down, a nine-banded armadillo, Raleigh Dynamo, turtles. Ah, come on, turtles! Turtles are famous, and the seamen always gather them. Natural modern pressure has changed that a little bit. Um, a tailless agouti, which we didn't see other one. Um, our English, or our, our, our Dutch, Dutch um, as a, um, thing in the river, doesn't know what an agouti is. He likens it to a hair, and you see the ears are pretty short, and there really is no tail. My light is so ceased. There's no reason for that. Battery might have died. Battery might have died. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> okay. You'll have to suffer through this then without any illustrations. But you can look at the thing and see as well as I can do. Um, Bounties of air for a leopard. part. Leopard. Spanish for ocelot. Five, a giant ant eater. They're actually termite eaters, sitting on his tail. That is an that's a, that's an actually an actual posture. Um, tigre, tigre, Spanish for the, the truly dangerous jaguar. <coughs> Peccary, wild pig. Leone, the mountain lion, which you've seen before on the on the uh, earlier thing that Amis did. Delta butt deer. Here, and the last one, a pre -con conquest of deer dog. As I can testify by my own states of Vienna, Vienna, Venezuela, all the animals he put on the map except the Ur dog still inhabit the wilds of Guiana. Sorting out human populations in the territories they inhabited in Raleigh's text was much, more dis was much more difficult. It was with pain enough that Hanius had not only to extract some 14 nations of indigenous, but also had to fit them into only nine territories, provinces. That's the Walter's test mention. In the interest of time, let us limit ourselves to some that are perhaps of special interest in connection with the restraining act. The first people are the cannibals, whom you see some of that, the Cisco cannibales on there, whom some followers of Montaigne suggest Raleigh did not portray as eaters of human flesh. 
since Mangus's very first image, which you saw before this thing collapsed, or I collapsed, the very first image of its cannibal, the main title, title page of Rollins persuading, shows him carrying a human hammer, am I? It is unlikely that Raleigh and he really eschewed Othello's translation of them as anthropophagi, i.e. man, man eaters. However this may be, Hondius did assign diverse nations of them to a large territory north of the Oro Orinoco that he entitled Caribana, an eastern group of Caribs that posed a threat to Raleigh's attempt to explore the mouth of the Canyon Mara. Not to speak of a nation of cannibales that the engraver placed south of where the Orinoco is built up, as well as a couple of Caribe settlements along the coast, as reported by both Chemus and the Rotterdam Dutch. That is not true of the Amazons, whose myth gives us gives, gives the great, great river its name. True, Hondius depicts them again, but this time with the lovely figure of an Amazon woman. But how shall I put this? One clothed very differently from the lawyer made reaching the title page that was saving it. While Raleigh nowhere describes the Amazon, describes Amazons as going nude, one can't help but think that behind this image lie a couple of well-translated passages describing his reaction to probably close to naked wives of chieftains he encountered along after all the hot and humid Orinoco. There was one, well, anti-colonialists are very aware of what European colonialists did to native population and traffic by putting it on clothes. All right, there was one he writes as well favored as, and as well shaped as any I saw, as, I, as ever I saw any in England, and after, afterward I saw many of them, which, but for their tawny color, may be compared to any of Europe. Well, there's a good first hint of racism, isn't there? However that may be, Hondius makes it amply clear that despite the thick bow on which this Amazon leans, archery has not made, made her breasts either. Interestingly enough, from a textual standpoint, the new cartoon also translates all its description of Amazon mating customs. Inasmuch as the reciting of the Dutch text Amidst this very passage, here is one clear instance in which Hondius has gone directly back to the 1596 English edition for the relevant text and translated it. As for assigning the Amazons of province, that was impossible inasmuch as their home territory was some 60 leagues upstream from the mouth of the Amazon, though thus nowhere near Guyana. Uh, now, how do we stand here for time? 7.30. Hey, pardon? 7.30. And when do you, when you want me to stop? Whenever you Okay. Hang on. <laughs> Whereas Wally seems to have believed in the myth of the Amazons right up to the very end because it was universal, he nevertheless remained skeptical about the acephaly, acephaly. that is the headless people. Hondius's carton nonetheless leaves a definitive image of, and I quote Shakespeare here, men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders that still haunts all Raleigh's studies. Not only that, he assigned them a specific territory west of a large lake, Casipa, some 120 miles upstream to the west of the colony. This correctly puts the locale in the midst of the modern Roleperisa Figuri that has recently turned this stretch of the Carani in the Venezuela's second largest body of water. Following Raleigh, Andes named the area Iwaipanoma, <coughs> adding that in this province, Senor Raleigh writes that the people without heads are a very strong and harsh nation. On the east side of the Rio Carani, do you know? You can see the Kenya City, Rio Carney. Do you know where it is? No? Does it come from the Delta? Oh, we got a lot in there. Okay. Here is here is the Carney right in here. And it, there is a casita 
with the secret that we're talking about. Okay? And this seems to be, as far as I can see, the outline of what is what is what is being considered the Empire of Guiana. Who rules it? Oh, and so forth. presents us with another myth, this time a historical one, and one that all of it cost us in life because of the continued beliefs. Unlike the titles of either of Sir Walter or Sir Walter's or Chemus's accounts in English, the Dutch translation of Raleigh's discovery sets this story as a focal point of his work. You recall the top of the first page on which the persuading opens, the last notion left to dominate our minds before starting to read is a remarkable subtitle that describes the kingdom of Guiana as, and I quote, presently occupied by the ancient inhabitants of Peru. Raleigh's hypothesis is simple. As the conquistadores advance towards the north end of the Inca highway at Quito, survivors in this part of the high altitude empire, they still wore large coats and hats of privilege crimson color apparently, withdrew to Guiana with their forces intact. Given Sir Walter's idea, we're back to the earlier part of the paper, of the headwaters of the Orinoco, this was not unfeasible. Following the Madalena River Valley, which is the primary route between, in, in the, between the Andes, between the, uh, right through the Andes, north to south, northerners fleeing Quito could readily head towards Bogota and then take the pass through the eastern Cordillera of the Andes. Indeed, commonly used when traveling in or over Nogo. <clears throat> and and he's, he, he has pretty well outlined this for you. Remember, I talked about here's, here is his over Nogo. Where's the main top? That goes up here. Is that the main top? I think so. That, so you see, I'll pick that up. And he's going to be coming from Quito. That's much further than you guess by this map. However, that's the idea that he had. Once, once they reached Wally's Meta or Meta or Anoko, they could simply ride with the current. Well, it's not that simple. To the east side of the Great Lake Casipa and set up the, a nice quote, Great and Golden Kingdom. The Dutch do not call it a Kingdom, I do not call it an empire, they call it a kingdom. The Koning Lake of, of Guiana. Great and golden indeed, Rahanis depicts it as stretching from the frontier town, Maka Guraya. About, about, about right in there. And uh, today that, today's that for the subsequent city of Pontius. Lies. Guarding and the, which Upata guarding the pass over the Imataka range southeastward down to the Amazon and then west west, west northwest and to the Rio Cas Casnero, including the entire south shore of the rumored Great Lake Salt Lake, supposedly 200 leagues long. <coughs> I don't need to point that out to you. You see how they're, they're thinking about. <clears throat> Not to speak of Manoa, the supposedly largest city in the native world that stood on the North Shore, which the Spanish themselves call El Dorado. While the discovery indicates that Raleigh did his best to get funding with natives to unite with each other and with Queen Elizabeth against the Spanish, the one group of native people, and I may be wrong about this, so check me if you wish, for not only did he think them to be um, one group of native people that he really intended to subdue and plunder was the Incan, a pyramid. For not
not only did he think them to be unbelievably rich, but they had criminally subjugated other native groups in the area that were now ready to ally with him against them. However, advised that his present forces were too weak for such an undertaking, Sir Walter postponed such an action until the next year. Thanks to war, politics, and a sentence of life imprisonment imposed in 1603 for opposing the accession of King James, he never had a chance to carry out the one major attack he planned against the native group that might in fact have proven or disproven the existence of an Incan El Dorado in, the, in Venezuela, in the north, north rather than the south portion of the kingdom. Okay, Inca, Incan gold then. Dorado fables once more. Hang on. According to Hobbes, Hans's caption regarding the hills in Greek south of the lake, most of these Rocky Mountains contain gold loads. And that's what he's talking about. I'm not sure about the loads, but there is certainly alluvial gold in the streams there. That's been proved. Loads in the sand of the river around this lake, there's also much gold. Modern alluvial deposits there, there have, verified, have verified that claim. Much uh, more important, Hondius's latitude but Raleigh's fabulously rich, gold rich mountains at about 180 miles directly south of Puerto Rodas, a new modern, modern city at the mouth of the Caroni. Today's, that's, um, that's going to be the mouth of the Caroni is there, and there's where the new city of Puerto Rodas is. So I'm talking about this area, street south now, okay? Today still rich, still gold rich, El Callao, I'm sorry, El Callao, lies some 110 natural miles a bit farther to the southeast from Puerto Rodas, while Guiana's gold basin today stretches from there to the edge of the Creole Gran Serrano, which lies in the basin of the upper county. We're talking about extension of the colony somewhere in here. There's no way that's put on this map. Okay. Indeed, the mining town actually named El Dorado is but 241 statute miles south of the Orinoco, while La Cristina, Las Cristinas, the giant gold mine there, is still a world phenomenon that makes the one rich load shown Wally along the Orinoco M15 mine sound quite puny. In short, Sir Walter and his Spanish predecessors were not wrong about the general location of the two of the two El Dorado. On the contrary, it just took until 1849 before a couple of lucky prospectors stumbled across the rich loads at El Cajillano and set off one of the biggest gold rushes ever seen. And we're talking, therefore, about this entire section way right down in here in those mountains. Well, it's time to conclude, which I'm sure you'll be glad. <laughs> time to conclude. Since the days of extraordinary Tila, there's little other document commentary to the effect that the De Blaise famous Latin translation of Raleigh and Kemus sprang not from the English original, but from Klaus's native Dasa text. According to this revised point of view, though, the implication is that the De Blaise should not have based the version on what has had, what had been dubiously termed corrupted Dutch translations made for Cornelius Klaassen, i.e., specifically, anachronisms that were quote, shortened in certain places, lacked dedicatory epistles, corrupt prefaces, and suffered from many spelling flaws, the number of which got hard artists, their translator for German of uh, allegedly augmented. I have to say, in light of the Hondi's assertion about Sir Walter Raleigh's hand in publishing and directing the Varachta of the Australia, such inference is quite awry. 
Editorially speaking, the Dutch translation was the right copy text on which the De Brains correctly chose to base their work. After all, Raleigh's last word on his beloved discovery, that Kimis' second voyage, providing a first look at Guiana, reside not in the already original English, English originals of 1596, the printed ones, I guess, but in the revised Amsterdam translation of both texts as authorized by Hondes' engraved colophon, with as I call it. What we fanciers of Raleigh's Elizabethan world therefore need, and I assume you wouldn't be here if you weren't part of one of those, part of that group, is a full dress scholarly edition of the complete Glossin translation that complements Professor Armour's masterly handling of Sir Walter Dunn. So all this discovery. The English and Dutch texts in the original please scholarly apparatus and new station also in English. Uh, and that for scholars who have had little chance to work in Dutch, Flemish, or Afrikaans. This way, maybe we'll get to hear Raleigh in his action, in his final words. Now, well, thank you for your very precious time. It's been a, I'm sorry for the one. I mean, presenting is no fun, but preparing is lovely. <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions. Are any of the cities that are shown on the map that you've been referring to, Manoas, uh, the other one by the lake, are, are, do they, are they still functioning modern cities? Or are there only archaeological ruins? <laughs> There were people here that can better answer your, your question than I can. First of all, the Great Salt Lake uh, might or might not be the result of flooding in later years, um, but, but it would be, it would be, it would be, uh, it would be, it, that would not be the problem that is set up here. And why it would be salt, I have no idea. There may be some sort of minerals in it, but I don't know what they mean by salt. I mean, if you look at the, uh, in the King James translation of the Bible, uh, what salt is, salt is a very strange word. I don't think it refers to NACL. <laughs> no, um, am I, have I answered that question accurately for you? Or is it supposed to be? I think you have. Yeah, well, we don't know that, that we don't know what's, what's involved there. After all, he's trying to get in there from those long rivers. See them coming out? He's trying to get in there. They never ma managed to get in there. And again, as I said, the politics from the accession of James first ultimately cut off his head. He never had a chance to go back and look, look for any of that. Excuse me. Excuse me. What do you see as the primary value of looking at Raleigh's text today? So for instance, if you were teaching it in the classroom, how well, would you justify it to your students? I don't know. I think it's lots, I think it's lots of fun. Um, we are engaged in a lot of American history and colonial history, and the history is not a, is, is not a, is not something we should abandon. It's very, it's very, it's very good to abandon it for short-term aggressions, but for long-term, uh, for long-term uh, cooperation with civilizations, no. Uh, that, that's a sly response to you. I'm not sure that's really doing much for you. No, I agree. It's, it's important to look outside our own. Yeah, I mean, really, yeah. Uh, that's the uh, as your colleague next to you uh, points out so very nicely. It's. Uh, in modern times have just seen an explosion of, of long overdue of study by of, of, of native cultures. And we just not we just don't have it. Um, and I'm not into this either. I'm, I'm just with one of the early Europeans, though he's not a nut. And and Raleigh, uh, I my my book there, 
primarily goes out after uh, after the judgments to Mali as a, as a fraud, perhaps mentally unbalanced, so forth. I think that's absolute nonsense. He, he did his very best, but he came darn close to succeeding. At least for me. So I changed my view from what the usual literary one, which is where I began. And when I went down to Venezuela, I had to simply turn that around 180 degrees when I tried to match the match to where he said he went. Or the charts, I should say. So certainly a value to Raleigh studies as well. Thank you. Well, no, thanks. Gosh, thanks for, for listening to this. Very nice reading. Any other questions? Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah. There's a, there are a couple of